In modern literature, especially in fantasy worlds, city-states tend to have a very common appearance. Whenever they do come up, they usually take one of three different forms. You have the trade city-states, modeled after either Venice or Genoa. You have the cultural city-states, modeled after either Athens or Florence. And you have the militaristic city-states, modeled after either Sparta or every medieval Italian city-state ever. Through this, the term city-state tends to have a very Eurocentric connotation, unless it specifically falls under the category of Desert Oasis Trade Hub, which it could. The thing we tend to forget is that there have been many other city-states across history, with their own unique cultures, languages, economic systems, and architecture. So today we'll be taking a look at the Swahili coast in specific, and their impact across the world. Our story begins, as African civilizations often do, with the migration of the Bantu people in the first millennium BCE. Small towns of Bantu and local inhabitants began popping up during their Iron Age, with local trade being carried out through small canoes up and down the coast. This was aided by the fact that coral reefs formed pockets of shallow and calm waters, and many small islands could provide shelter and stopping points. As more people moved along the coast, a wide variety of agricultural practices were taken hold of across the region, from animal husbandry to irrigated farms and even fishing. Building resources also varied from town to town. There was stone, coral, wood, and a mix of either mortar or mud being used to construct the houses. Jewelry was also a common item made from shells and to be traded with the inland communities. This natural trade allowed ideas of agriculture, architecture, and language to be eventually spread over 1,000 miles of Africa's coastline. Before we go on, I want to address the problem with the word Swahili. You see, Swahili comes from an Arabic word, Sahil, which means coast. Swahili means people of the coast. You can probably see the issue here. Swahili can be used to describe people from Somalia to Mozambique. While Swahili is counted as one language as well, there are many different dialects, and, many, and they have many Arabic terms mixed in. So just keep in mind, when I say Swahili, a lot falls under that category, and I am by no means intending to discredit the individual cultures of the many Swahili people. Disclaimer over, on to the show. The coastal settlements continue to expand into poor cities with bustling local trade without much change until the 7th century. In said 7th century, Muslim merchants from Egypt and Saudi Arabia descended upon the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, and Indian Ocean. This lined up perfectly with the monsoon patterns. You see, from December to March, the winds blow northeast, and from April to November, they blow southwest. This allows merchants to make their journeys all in one year, without having too much of a layover. This makes the rate at which goods are exchanged much faster than in other parts of the world. Soon, these port settlements grew to full-blown medieval city-states. By the mid-8th century, Persian merchants began to set up their own cities or emigrate to already existing ones. This resulted in a cultural explosion of art, architecture, and political structures. It is kind of like its own Swahili renaissance, and it clearly deserves more attention. I see this as a good time to bring up that this was all taking place 600 years before Venice was at its peak, and about 700 years before the Italian Wars kicked off, along with the Renaissance in Europe. There isn't really a point to that other than to contrast how similar the city-states were, and how um, they rose at different times in history, which is just really interesting to see. The most prominent city-states around this time are as follows. Mogadishu, Kilwa, Mombasa, Zanzibar, and Ibo. The thing I personally find really interesting about these city-states is, with the exception of Mogadishu, the city-states focused on cultivating trade and craft, rather than conquest. This draws direct opposition to the city-states like Athens, Sparta, and Venice, and of course many others, who either tried to conquer for political power or trade influence. It also seems that no one city-state could produce enough food to be sustainable on its own, so they relied not only on trade with the outside world, but with the people of the interior as well. 
Speaking of all this trade, let's take a look at some of the specifics, shall we? The Swahili city-states acted as a sort of intermediary for trade. Goods came from the interior of Africa along the coast to be sold. The Swahili city-state Sofala even was able to collect goods from Great Zimbabwe. The city-state simply had merchants and vendors pay duties on the imports and exports. In the other direction, goods came from Arabia, Persia, and India, and through these places, goods even came in from China and Southeast Asia to be bought and sold. For the political structure of each city, the Swahili states generally seem to be ruled by one person, sort of like a sultan, although I couldn't find the process for how these leaders were generally chosen. There seems to be a lack of sources on the subject. The governing body of each city was generally made up of Muslim merchants by the 12th century CE. There were also armies of advisors and bureaucrats assisting the sultan of each city. The social structure often differed from port to port, although the general take on it seems to be that there were three different classes in society. The first were the merchants, craftsmen, governors, and those who held religious office, making up a lot of the population. The second class were slaves. These slaves were generally from the African interior, but since slavery is not a pleasant topic in any form, we shall move past it because I do not like talking about it. The third class was pretty much made up of Persian and Arab merchants who never actually settled in any city, but rather moved in and out as the winds changed. Unfortunately, every story has to have an ending, and the fall of the Swahili began with the arrival of Vasco, screw the Ottomans, I'm going to sail around Africa, da Gama, the Portuguese explorer. Those who came after him didn't simply come to trade, but came to completely control the Indian Ocean, starting with East Africa. While the city-states were usually cooperative in times of peace, the rulers couldn't band together in times of war, and the city-states fell one by one under foreign influence. The Portuguese constructed forts at Sofala in 1505 and Mozambique Island in 1507, securing their hold over the East African trade. The Portuguese ruled with an iron fist, extracting whatever resources they could for as little cost as possible. Even as trade shifted north, and East Africa became a less valuable venture, the Swahili city-states were almost gone. Some continued to trade slaves and ivory for a while after, but it would never be the same again. That is a rather sad ending. but we can still take a look at the impact these city-states had that we often overlook. They created a culture not all around collecting cash and growing fabulously rich, although they did in the process, but off of trading because it was a necessity in order to survive. Up and down the coast, these maritime kingdoms shared commodities, religion, architecture, and language, and even after they were gone, their culture still lives on in the Swahili people, and that is something we should never forget. Thank you for watching. I hope this video was able to give you an appreciation for these often forgotten cultures. If you want to check my sources, they should be in the description. If they're not there right now, I will add them at a later date. If you have a suggestion for a future topic, comment them down below, and I will add it to the list. This has been the History Broadcast, signing off.